Take your Bibles and go to the book of Proverbs, chapter number 29. Proverbs 29. Three weeks ago, we started preaching on uh, uh, Do You See What I See? And, uh, and for some reason, I know what 2020 years, everybody's getting geared up for 2020. And the big themes is going to be vision going into January. Uh, but the Lord wants us doing it now. So we're ready for 2020. Say amen. amen. And uh, so we're going to preach on the power of a vision. The power of a vision. There's too many guys, people walking around defeated. Amen. Too many guys, people walking around discouraged. Too many guys, people walking around looking across the aisle and uh, looking at somebody else and trying to measure up to somebody else and who they are and what they are or what they have or what they don't have. And they're missing out on the greatest thing that they could ever have. And that is what the Lord Jesus Christ has for you in your life, in your life. Look at Proverbs chapter number 29, verse number 18. The Bible says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Let's pray. Lord, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to be able to stand one more time and ask you this morning. Cross in the fashion, God, Lord, is going to be the greatest help to your people. God, Lord, and let me deliver it the way you deliver it to my soul. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Notice something. Have you, how many of y'all been in church more than 10 years? More than 20 years? Anybody been in church more than 30 years? 40 years? 50? Can I get 50? Can I get 50? Can I get 50? Amen. Amen. Listen, how many of you have seen people that you went to church with who once was on fire for God, I mean just living for the Lord, and then it fizzled out? And they're not in church no more. Some not even serving God no more. Some of them has even been like Peter, even denounced, even that they didn't even know God. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Listen, it is highly possible, understand me this morning, it is very possible to be saved and on your way to heaven and end up in that state. Why? Look what the verse just said. Without a vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. A man without a vision is a man without a future. A man without a future will always return to his past. You hear what I'm saying? A man without a vision is a man without a future. And a man without a future will return to his past. What are you saying? You want to know why a lot of people, what the terminology we use is called backslide. Y'all know what I mean when I say backslid or backslide. You want to know why a lot of people backslide on the Lord in return to their past and us supernatural or super spiritual people. They'll say, well, they probably didn't have it anyway. No, my friend, it's highly possible to be saved on your way to heaven and find yourself in a backslidden condition because of why? A man without a vision is a man without a future. And a man without a future is going to return back to his past. Why? Because the Bible says, and look what it says, where, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. That's why the Lord is moving on my heart to begin and to continue preaching on these vision things and about getting a vision because some of you, you can't not see past the chair that's in front of you. Some of you can't see beyond your circumstances. Some of you, you walk around in gloom and doom and as soon as a little tribulation or a little trouble rises up in your life, the first thing you want to do is start doubting God. The first thing you want to do is start doubting your church. Start doubting your salvation and want to quit and give up on God. But understand something, just like you're learning in Sunday school, God is the one that brought the children of Israel down into Egypt land. God was the one that had a divine appointment for them to spend 430 years in bondage. But God also had a divine appointment to the very day. 430 years to the day that they would march out of that bondage. They would march out of that place called Egypt. Listen to me, child of God. You got to look beyond your circumstances. You got to look beyond your trouble and see that, hey, God has a reason and a purpose for you in your life. Listen, vision is the bridge between the present and the future. Without it, we perish or go unrestrained. Vision, listen to me this morning. I'm going to have to read a lot of my notes so I don't get sidetracked. Vision gives pain a purpose. 
Those without vision spend their lives taking the path of least resistance as they try to avoid discomfort. Let me say that again. This is why some of you are lazy on God. Because you're taking the least path of resistance. You take the easy road out. Because you don't like pain. You don't like suffering. But truth of the matter is, is you've lost your vision. When you have a vision, it gives your pain purpose. Listen. The level of sacrifice that a vision requires will determine the size of people who follow. Sacrifice separates the small from the great. The small from the great. When you go and read about, hey, the older men of God, when you go and read about those who God has really used, they, it was an act of obedience, but to walk with the Lord and have the power of God on your life, this would have to be an act of sacrifice on your life. You want to know why some of you don't get nothing out of Sunday morning because you won't sacrifice Sunday night. You know why some of you don't get nothing out of Sunday morning or your Bible reading because you won't go to Sunday school. You won't come back on Wednesday night because it's a sacrifice. And let me tell you something. If you're ever going to go anywhere with God, if you're ever going to mount anything, you're going to have to give a level of sacrifice because without a vision, the people perish. Listen, consider an example right here. A young man who graduates from high school and joins the military. As soon as he steps off the boot camp bus, the sergeant begins yelling at him. He has to march over to the barber shop and get his head shaved. Then he's up early in the morning to exercise with someone screaming at him and talking about his mama. Just a month before, the same young man was in high school. He would have never put up with any of this nonsense from his teachers or classmates. Just a few months prior, he would never take somebody screaming at him and holler at him and cussing him for everything in the bus, talking about his mama, talking about what he looks like. But listen to me, but somehow his whole mindset has changed. Something has changed in his mind. How can a high school graduate go from living at home, going to school, to having somebody up in his face, screaming and hollering him, getting up early in the morning, pushing him to the max, telling him when to go to bed, telling him when to go up, loading his back down with gear, making him exercise in the mud, in the rain. There's no limitations. They're pushing him to the max. Why would he go through that? Because his mindset has changed, my friend. Why is he enduring the cross, so to speak? Because of the joy on the other side of it. Why is he enduring it? Because he knows in six weeks, this boot camp's going to be over. In six weeks, I'm going to stand at graduation ceremony, and I'll be become a soldier. I'll become a Marine. You see my friend, some of you ain't got no vision. You're not making a sacrifice and you won't keep going. But that's why your smiles go. That's why your shouts go. That's because your fellowships go. Without a vision, the people perish. But if a high school boy can leave the high school, step up in boot camp and know that hey, there's a better day coming. I say a child of God who's on their way to heaven should rise up and see there's a better day coming listen 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 his vision his vision of the future is giving his present physical discomfort meaning and purpose People's asked me, I don't know how many times this month, because the camper we live in is up here. We stayed up here during the month of pumpkin patch. We're still here. And people's asked me, how in the world? How in the world? How in the world can you and your wife and two kids stay in such a small place? Don't it get tiresome? Don't it get this? Don't it get that? How are you doing it? Yes, it gets aggravating. Yes, the walls come in sometimes. And yeah, hey, the kitchen, the living room, Taylor's bedroom, the kitchen sink, the microwave, the refrigerator is all in the same room. And you know what? And you got the bathrooms in my bedroom. I can literally step out of bed and sit on the toilet all in one step. Say amen right there. How do you do it? I'll tell you why. The day we moved in that thing, I had a blueprint in my mind. And I know there's a day coming when that house that we're 
we're going to build is going to be erected and it's going to stand. You say, preacher, is it ever going to happen? Yes, it's going to happen. And the pain and the discomfort is worth it. But how can I endure it? I got my mind on what lays ahead, not what surrounds me without a vision. The people perish. Listen, his vision of the future is giving his present physical discomfort meaning and purpose. And let's just be honest, we're a group of people who don't like discomfort. We're a group of people who don't like sacrifice. So many of us go through life not understanding, listen to me this morning, not understanding the purposes of our trials. Too many of God's people quit right in the middle of tribulation, right in the middle of trial, right in the middle of hardships. That's where they quit because they've never really truly understood the purpose of the trials. We spend our days walking a crooked path, believing that every obstacle in the road is a problem and something to avoid. That's the way most people live their life. That every obstacle that rises up, every problem that rises up, that is something to avoid. But I beg to differ according to the authority of the Word of God. It is not something to avoid. It is something to develop you. It is something to mature you. It is something to teach you, to make you a better person, a better soldier. Whenever the children of Israel marched into Egypt land for 430 years, gathering the straw, being ruled and reigned by the taskmasters, making the brick, having to do all the hard work. I'm sure there was a time in their life amen, where they felt like there wasn't no good. But I imagine how they felt the day when Moses said grab up your tents. Get up your gear. It's time to giddy up and to go. I wonder how they felt then. I wonder how it was. Forty years in the wilderness. Wandering around and around and around. Hey, but on that glorious day when, jo- hey, when Joshua and Caleb hey, led those out into that land this flowing with milk and honey. I wonder how it felt then. I wonder how it felt, mamas. Hey, when you was laying in that labor room and you felt the pain, the excruciating pain of that baby kicking and getting ready to come into this world. Oh, some of you, you was mad. Some of you got upset. Some of you cussed your husband. Some of you wished to God you never got impregnated. But the moment that that daughter laid that baby on your bosom, you didn't think no more about it. Why? Because your vision was laid before you. You've got to have a vision to be able to endure this life. Or you will perish. Look, look at the latter part of that verse. The second part of the verse says, But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. The law isn't just something God gave to Moses. Law is not to harm you. The law is good for you. Without a vision, the people perish. Which means you need a vision. Because if not, you're not going to survive. But having that vision and in this life is going to bring sacrifice. It's going to bring discomfort. It's going to bring hardships. It's going to try you and test you. So how in the world could problems and obstacles and burdens and hardships and tribulations, how can you have joy in the midst of tribulation? How can you be happy in the midst of trouble? The Bible tells you in the same verse right there, but he that keepeth the law, he that keepeth the law, happy is he. You know what the law of God is? It is a restraint. It is a restraint. What do you mean? That's what I don't like about the law because it tells me what I can't do and what I can't do. But listen, God gave you a law to restrain you, to help keep you, to help keep you. If there was no restraints on you, my friend, you would live like you want to live. You would go out there and do things that would take you to an early grave. The law is to restrain you, to keep you. But the law also sets boundaries. That's where a lot of people begin to fall out with God in the church whenever they find out what the boundaries are. But truth of the matter is, you've got to have boundaries in your life. You've got to have them. 
And the only way to have them is the authority of the Word of God. And the Bible says, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Do you know a lot of them out there looking in here, all they see is a group of people who are restrained and have boundaries. They can't go do this and they can't do that. Well, I beg the different. And every, all those that listen by way of live stream are going to listen. And you listen to me good. I can go and do any living thing that I want to do. If I want to go buy me a 12 pack of Budweiser, I can go buy me a 12 pack of Budweiser. I got the dollars to do it and the ID to show for it. Say amen right there. I know where the pot dealer is at in Indian land. If I want to go back on drugs, I can go back on drugs. Hey, hey, my friend. Hey, it ain't that I can't. It's just that I got some restraint on me, but I also got some boundaries on me. And there's some places that the law of God has told me, you better not go. Why? Because if I go to those places, I'm going to fall right back into the mess that God delivered me out of. The law and the boundaries is to protect you, to keep you out of harm's way. I don't sit here in regret when I see the way they live. I don't sit here and regret. When I go to the ball game and they're over there getting drunk and all that and, and they're living it up, I don't sit there and say, man, I wish I could have a drink. I don't know why I can't drink. I sit there and thank God I don't have to drink. I don't need to drink. God delivered me from that. There's some boundaries there. And you know what? I enjoy the ball game. I come in happy. I go home happy. My head ain't split and I still got the $100 in my pocket. Why? because happy is he that keeps and loves the law of God the law it restrains you to keep you it sets some boundaries to protect you number three break up number three for me Jonathan it disciplines to direct you you hear me you've got to have the law in your life because if I didn't have some discipline, get direction, I wouldn't know where God was taking me. And I would miss God. Without a vision, the people perish. But happy is He. Happy. Don't you want to be happy? You ever wonder why? You ever wonder, I, I wonder this. Maybe you don't wonder because you don't look at what I look at. I often wonder why so many of y'all look so miserable. You know what? One of the most miserable places I've ever been in life, it's not church, it was the dentist chair. And guess where there is a place I very seldom occupy? The dentist chair. Why? Because it brings me pain and agony, and I don't like them. I've never liked them. I'll tell you something else I don't like needles. And I'm not going to voluntarily go in there. And I, I thank God for Red Cross. And I appreciate all of you that donate blood. But Tim just ain't one of them going to walk up in one of them red and white buses and lay my arm out there and say, stick it, baby, and take all you want to take. I don't like needles. So I, what I'm saying is this. One of two things. Either you're miserable because you've lost your vision or you're miserable because you just don't know God. And church makes you miserable. It's one of the two things. Now listen, you can be a child of God and hit a dry spot. But that don't mean you got to be miserable. Amen. You can be a child of God and get to a desert spot. But that don't mean you got to be miserable. So the most beautiful land in our country is in the desert. It's the desert. It's not a bad place to be. I love it. I love when I get to take a trip out west. I love the painted desert out there. I love the Navajo land out there and all that. And Uncle John seen all that. That's a beautiful place. But I ain't going to live there. Right. I ain't going to live there. There ain't no place like the place we're at right now. Say amen. amen. Two and a half hours to the beach, two and a half hours to the mountains. We got all that we need. Say amen. amen. But what I'm trying to get to this morning is that, listen, there's power in vision. And if you don't have no vision, you ain't going to have no power. 
And the reason so many of God's people don't have no power in their life because they've lost their vision. The only thing you see yourself in is just a Sunday morning go to church Christian. But God has more for you than to be just a Sunday morning go to church Christian. God has a divine purpose in your life. And God wants to use you to be a tool in somebody else's life that they may come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They may find encouragement. But this world ain't going to get no help from the church if the church don't have a vision. You want to know why? I know of churches right now that's without pastors, closing their doors. And if something don't happen, I know of some locally that in the next 10 years, if something don't happen, their doors will be shut. And you know what happened? The people has lost their vision. Vision. And I'm preaching to somebody this morning that if something don't change in your life a year from now, you're not going to be sitting where you're sitting at. You're going to be falling by the wayside. That's why I'm preaching like I'm preaching because I don't want you to fall. I don't want you to go away. I want you to stand until the end and become all that God has for you to be. But without a vision, you're not going to make it. Hey, my friend, hey, it disciplines us to direct us through obstacles instead of around them. These three things, the restraint, the boundaries, and the disciplines. Listen, these three things become the fire that forge our character so we can attain and maintain a life of greatness. You hear me? So, the big question this morning is, what is a vision? What is vision? Vision is what we see but it's also the way in which we see. Listen to me. Vision is what we see, but it is also the way in which we see it. Some of you see the skies as partly cloudy. Some of you see it as partly sunny. But both of you is looking at the same sky. Hear what I'm saying? Vision is the lens that interprets the events of our life, the way we view people, and our concept of God. If we have, listen, if we have a scratch on our glasses, it may seem like everybody around us has scratches too. Hear me? If you got a scratch on your glass, It's going to look like everybody has scratches. But the problem actually lies with us because it's our vision that is impaired. You see, what I'm saying is your life may not be as bad as you're thinking right now. But the reason your life is so miserable right now has probably got a lot to do with your vision. Listen, Jesus said that our eyes are the windows of our heart and Paul prayed that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened in other words we perceive with our eyes but we see with our hearts hear me I'm trying to help you we perceive with our eyes what's wrong with her Why is he looking like that? Do you see that look on his face? He must be mad at the world. And in your heart, you've already formulated your opinion of that individual. Look at him. He's the most stuck up person. You know what they say, first impressions is everything? That's a lie. Because I've met some people before, and what I perceived with these, and what I acknowledged in my heart towards the individual, I was way off. I thought they was one some of the most stuck up, egotistical people I've ever met in my life. But to only find out that my first encounter, my first impression with them, they just got a, a case of a bad stomach virus. Any of y'all ever had that? Amen. When you get a case of the bad stomach virus, like I had the other week, you ain't going to want to look at nobody. You ain't going to want to talk to nobody. You ain't going to want to be around nobody. You know what? But that first impression, what I'm trying to get you to see is you got 
got to start looking at things through the eyes of God and see things the way God sees them. Let your eyes be and your heart be what the Bible tells you. You need to pray like Paul prayed that your eyes of your heart would be enlightened because your eyes are the windows of your heart. Because what you're seeing is, my friend, is what's going to formulate your opinion of everything around you this morning. Say amen right there. Some of you, you got up this morning and you had a stack of bills on your table. Some of you got up this morning, you didn't have much food in your refrigerator and you perceive that life is bad. But I'm here to tell you, if you are a born again child of God, you can't look at the stack of bills or the less of food in the fridge. You got to look at your God above who says you'll never see my life. I'm trying to tell you, you got to get a vision or you're going to perish, my friend. Listen, listen. Our minds receive images from our eyes, but our heart interprets those images. You hear me? Your mind receives it from your eyes, but then your heart interprets it. If our heart, listen to me, listen to me, if our heart becomes bitter, if our heart becomes jealous, if our heart becomes hurt or some way infected, then the lens of our heart is distorted. What we perceive is happening and what is really going on could be two completely different things. You ever walked in a room full of people? Maybe just two or three people. You can hear the chatter on the other side of the door. You open the door and you enter into the room and the chatter stops. And immediately... Your first thought is what? What? They're talking about me. And at that moment, your feelings are hurt. And for the rest of the time of your duration in that room with them other two people, you got something against them. Your mind is wondering. But truth of the matter is, they weren't talking about you at all. You just assumed and you know what assuming does, don't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, amen, amen. If you don't know, go see Graham after church and he'll tell you. Yeah. Listen, what we perceive is happening and what is really going on could be two completely different things. I've told this story before. I'm going to tell it again because it falls right in line. There was a time in my life I rolled up behind our shop years ago. This is back when Caleb was still a young man at home and Taylor was about, I don't know, four, five, six years old. And at the back of our shop, we had a big roll-up door. We also had a little side door that you entered into the shop. When I come around the side of that building in my truck coming in back there, all I seen was Taylor coming out the door. And all I seen was Caleb like that. I seen Caleb's hand and Taylor falling. Automatically, I get mad. Automatically, I'm upset. Automatically, I get out of my truck and I do something that some of y'all need to practice. I took something off of my waist that needs to be taken off and used on some of yours. Say amen. amen. I'm fixing to bust his butt the good old-fashioned way because he better not be pushing his sister down. I walked in the door. I walked around through there, and I went. I'm hollering Caleb. And I got my belt in my hand. And I'm fixing to wear his butt out. I, I still believe what the Bible says. Spare the rod, you'll spoil the child. It's still in there. Say amen. And I went to beat him, and about that time, his mama hollers. Wait a minute, wait a minute. No, I ain't waiting a minute. He done pushed Taylor down. I'm busting his butt. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What? He didn't push her. She tripped out the door. and He was trying to catch her. You see, what I've seen in my perception of it caused me to overreact and get ready to do something that was so undeserving. Where I seen was harm, it was actually good. Where I seen a brother pushing his sister was actually a big brother trying to save his sister. 
You hear what I'm saying this morning? Listen. What we perceive is happening and what is really going on could be two completely different things. People perceive in opinions of Greater Life Baptist Church is that Pastor Dr. Tim Blue has went liberal and is celebrating Halloween and all the demonic spirits that come with Halloween through October because he has blow-ups and, 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 and hay rides and pumpkins in the field. You see, they only ride by and just view. They won't stop and ask. They won't stop and become a part and see what the real meaning is behind it. You hear what I'm saying? Every one of us is guilty of perceiving things in a fashion that they're not. Jesus told us in the book of John, chapter 8, verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The word truth here in John 8 is used here is not referring to the Bible itself, although we know that the Bible is true, right? We all know in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? We all know all that. But here, what he is saying, the word truth means reality. Jesus is saying, you will understand what is real when you understand what is real, that is what will free you. You hear what I'm saying? When you find out what is real, how many times in church people look around and because nobody spoke to them that actual morning, the preacher didn't speak to them, the preacher didn't shake their hand, so the preacher don't love me, and the preacher don't like me, and the preacher don't acknowledge me, so I ain't going back to that, which is highly the opposite because the preacher had a lot on his mind. The preacher had to preach. He's got his mind on his message. He ain't seen nobody. All he's seen is how to get to the pulpit and deliver the message. He ain't overlooking. He ain't slighting nobody. He ain't downgrading nobody. He ain't trying to be rude or egotistic. He's just trying to keep his mind in his focus. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But see, so when you look around and realize that, hey, the truth is the preacher just wants to make sure that when he gets in the pulpit, his mind ain't deviated from what the Lord has from me. His mind ain't full of garbage of all of my problems and all of my sorrows. His mind ain't full of gossip. His mind ain't full of this and ain't full of that. It's only full of what he's been dealing with with the Lord, with his one-on-one one time with the Lord and I want my preacher to be able to get in the pulpit and deliver the message with the power and authority of God Almighty that God's people may get help. When you understand the truth and the meaning of the church, you won't get upset by the church. You won't get mad at the church. You won't run away from the church. You'll understand the truth of the church. And what God is saying is, hey, when you understand the reality what's really happened, then you'll become free. When you understand, here's a good one for the church. That's a family church. I, le- I had somebody leave church one time. My family left our church because my son was the associate pastor. My other son was the janitor or the cleaner, cleaner upper of the church. I got a brother-in-law that sits on the trustee board. Uh, my son's wife, hey, is the children's church administrator. Y'all know what I'm saying? And they looked at me and said, I knew this is the way it was. It's all, it ain't nothing but a family church. Your boy, he started bringing up Caleb. He said, your boy is the one. Hey, you know, you gave him the job. And I said, well, hey, if it's that big of a deal, I'll fire Caleb right now if you want the job. But I'll tell you why Caleb got the job. He didn't get the job because he was my son. He didn't get the job because he's the pastor's son. He got the job because he he was the only one that filled out an application and turned it in and wanted a job. I had no choice because I ain't got time to clean it. Y'all understand what I'm saying? But the perception from the pew is that all I'm doing is putting people in position that's my family. It's highly from it. And I said, the reason you find that it's the same ones doing it all because it's the same ones that's always showing up. It's the same one showing up for the work day. It's the same one showing up for the pumpkin pie. It's the same one. But hey, I promise you, we'll all take a step back if you want to do it. 
And this is what they said. Well, I ain't got time. <laughs> this is what I said. Shut up. <laughs> Why? Why? Because, listen to me, I'm trying to help you. If you don't have a vision sitting in these pews, you're going to get your eyes on the wrong thing. And the devil will feed your mind full of all kinds of garbage mm -hmm. to the point you'll start believing it. Yes, sir. And the next thing you know, you'll be another statistic. The preacher don't like you, the church don't like you, yada, 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 and you'll be gone. But you got to have a vision. Why? And God said that, hey, whenever you get a hold of the truth, when you get a hold of reality, it'll set you free. So many of us live in a virtual reality. The way we view life can feel and look real or make perfect sense, but still not be real at all. Hear me? Many people live a virtual reality. The way they view life can feel and look real. It make perfect sense, but still not be real at all. Let me ask you this. Any of y'all ever went to a movie? If you ain't, any of y'all watch Netflix? Watch movies at home? Yeah. You ever watched a movie and got totally into it? Y'all ever seen that SWAT? Y'all don't talk about SWAT? Y'all don't talk about uh, who's the black ball-headed dude? Who? Morgan. I call him Morgan from Criminal Minds. Hey, yes, sir. I have been in him driving that car. I've jumped out of the car with a gun in my hand, and I've mowed him down just like that big, buff, bald-headed black guy and all of his uh, actions and this, that, and other. I've been right there in it, and, man, and the worst thing about it is, boom, a commercial. <laughs> Be all up in it. Listen, you experience all the emotions of real life. Any of y'all go to Scary Winds this year? I went. It wasn't that scary. I only went because my boys wanted to go. You know, parents would do anything for boys. The biggest kick about it was I scared the devil out of Tyler. I got him good. I got him good. Why? Because you ain't supposed to touch over there. They can do all kinds of stuff. They can't touch you. So we're going through this one thing over there, and I don't care how you view it. You know, you can, I, I, that stuff ain't real. But, you know, we're walking through there, and it, there's dark spots. I mean, dark spots, Brandon. So we walked around that little bend, and I just slid up right behind the wall. I got right there. Tyler comes around, and I grab him. And when I grabbed him, I thought that boy, you know how he has a Holy Ghost fit in the church house? He, hey, hey, he, he, his voice level got a whole lot higher, man. And, man, he went to screaming and a hollering and this, that, and the other. Listen, for a moment, for a moment, he thought somebody done got him. For a moment, he done got ate up. For a moment, his life was over. He experienced all the emotions of fear, all the emotions of the horror, all the emotions of scare winds. To only find out it was daddy. <laughs> Listen, you may even leave the theater or scary winds still feeling it, but it was just a movie, it was never real. The truth is this this morning. Listen, we see what we believe to be true. Another way to put it is this. If you have the wrong pretext, you will have a misunderstanding of the context. Amen. Hear me? Lord, make your way up here. You hear me? If you have the wrong pretext, you will misunderstand the context. Without a vision, people perish. Let me ask you this morning, what is your vision? Not the vision of the church. Where do you see yourself five years from now? Where do you see yourself five days from now? If you don't have a vision, listen. The prodigal son came to himself in a pig pen. 
And he had a vision. A vision of a waiting, loving father at the house. And that vision of the house caused him to do something about his condition. The reason some of y'all, I want you right now, examine yourself. How are you spiritually this morning? And how was you spiritually five years ago? How are you financially this morning? And how was you five years ago? Still the same way? Stay in the same shape? Well, listen, if you don't get a vision five years from now, you're going to be in the same boat, the same way. You look around in here this morning, it's a decent number in here. Wish it was more. I'll never be satisfied. I'll never be satisfied when every chair's filled. When every chair that we got down in the garage is in here and they're standing around the walls out the front door, I'll still not be satisfied because my vision is bigger. Because whenever you get satisfied, you get complacent. You know what happens whenever you get complacent? You get stagnant. You know what happens when you get stagnant? Is listen. Nothing grows in stagnant water. Some of you in your marriages, your marriage got stagnant. Well, do do something. Do something to change it up. Have a vision, man. Oh, man, I ain't a teenager no more. Act like one every once in a while. Have a vision. Man, she don't, she don't do like she... Get a vision, man. See it. Make it happen. Vision. Vision. What I preached last week. Teamwork makes the dream work. And without a vision, you're going to perish. Eric, if you don't have a vision for your marriage, you, it won't last. Because the devil's going to throw everything he can at y'all's home. But you got to look beyond the circumstances right there. Amen, you got to see the ladder. What you going to be. You understand what I'm saying? You got to see better days ahead. Better days ahead. Trevor Shea, where's she at? She down in Children's Church this morning. Always talk about Sunday school. Where are you at right now in life? It's a good place. Been saved a year. Still got babies. Enjoy where you at. But don't get complacent where you at. And look ahead of what you're going to be. You got to have a vision, man. You got to have a vision, Stephen. But then when you get that vision, you got to work it. 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 How can I work it? By loving these law. Have some restraint with some boundaries and some discipline in your life. And that vision will come to pass. Caleb said, we can take the mountain. But the other ten said, no, we can't. They died in the wilderness. But when Caleb was 80 years old, he stood at the foot of the same mountain and said, you know what? I may be stricken in years. I may be old. But I can still take that mountain right there. Why? Because I know my God's grace is sufficient for every need. Why did he still have that spunk? Because 40 years prior, when he seen that mountain, he had the promise of God had given him that mountain. He looked beyond it. He had a vision that one day he he would stand on top of that mountain and guess what he stood there he stood there listen where's your life at this morning where's your life going if you're satisfied where you're at stay where you're at but let me tell you this don't bless God come complaining don't complain don't complain about your home situation. Don't complain about your marital status. Don't complain about your kids. Don't complain about your church. If you ain't willing to step up, get a vision and go and work that thing and say, by the grace of God and the authority of the Word of God, I'm going to work this thing and I'm going to make my vision become reality. I think I got the greatest marriage in the world. I got the greatest family in the world. I got the greatest church in the world. I got the greatest father in the world. 
I am his special son. You are to feel the exact same way. Why? I got a vision, my friend. There's a heavenly father that loved me, gave himself for me, washed me in his blood, prepared a place for me, coming for me. His grace is sufficient. Get a vision, church. Get a vision. Grab your wife by the hand. Get your child by the hand. Say, by the grace of God, we're going to march on and be something. Why? Because greater is he within. You are somebody. There's power in a vision. What I'm experiencing right now is not my vision. It was the vision of someone else. And they worked it. And now I am experiencing the reality, the dream of another group of congregations that Bo Draper, one or two of them even left here that was even here during 95 when they built this sanctuary. There ain't but just one or two of us that was here when the note was paid off seven years later, a whole lot earlier than it was supposed to be paid off. And now I'm feeling them goosebumps up my side. And most of the ones that paved the way for you to experience what you're experiencing right now is laying out there in that sod. There ain't but one, hey, or two of them that's still left that my friend is seeing the vision of what's happening and this man right here sits in my trustees meeting all the time and he says I may not see it in my day but I believe that one day this place is going to bust wide open it's going to fill up you got to build another sanctuary he ain't gave up on the vision that's why he's still here without a vision the people perish I'm trying to tell you church you got to get a hold of what God has for you and keep it dear to your heart and love the law of God keep the restraints, the boundaries the discipline and march forward for the cause of Christ don't settle for less when you can have so much more don't settle for less when you can have so much more more maybe that's why Uncle John's still around because God's going to let him see his vision and I wouldn't dare go into details of things that that man's done behind the scenes that nobody knows about that allows me to experience us experience what we're experiencing right now the sacrifices remember a while ago vision requires sacrifices Vision requires hardships, troubles, and trials. But remember in Genesis 15, God told Abraham, your children is going to go into bondage. One day they walked into Egypt. 430 years to the day, they walked out. But God said back in Genesis, I got to put them there so I can get them over here. see what's your perception this morning of what's going on in your life it's barely possible I believe on the authority of that book that where you're at right now God has brought you to it because he's got something better for you but if you quit where you're at if you give up where you're at if you lose your vision where you're at you're going to perish perish 